this, um, unless you've got a model to show you. You've got to have proved yourself, especially in Southland. If you haven't been doing what you say you think is important, if you haven't been doing it for at least 30 years, they're not really going to take much notice of you. They're like, oh, well, we'll see how he goes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like someone setting up a shop in, the, in the, any of the little villages around Southland. doesn't matter how wonderful your frontage is or yeah. what a great idea or where else it might be good. You've just got to hang in there and keep doing it. And it's only after a long period of time that people might go, oh, well, maybe they'll be all right. You know? <laughs> oh, I think that's quite good. I mean, I, when I first came here, I found the conservative mindset difficult. Mm. Now I don't. I understand where their values are. I think I understand where their values are and um, what what they bring to the to the discussion. Nice. And that what they bring is continuity and loyalty. You know, they're not they won't flip around and take off on the on the latest um, fancy, you know, and that, that's a really good thing. Especially mm. for us what happened here was because when we came here there wasn't really much being offered in terms of even um, brown bread. You couldn't buy, buy brown bread at the supermarket, just white bread. And we thought, mm, <laughs> this is going to have to change. Um, and so we set up a food cooperative and that was regarded as quite a hippie or greeny thing to do, which I suppose it was. But where we made our most progress is when we got involved, uh, well, we developed, Robin and I developed the um, Heritage Apple project called Open Orchard and we were going out, we noticed um, that there were a lot of old orchards all around the region and that they were falling into disrepair partly because the dairy industry was coming in at that stage and um, bowling those orchards over so we went out and said to the farmer, farmer, farmers, um, could we take cuttings from your uh, apple trees in particular because we'd learned to graft, an old-fashioned <coughs> method of grafting. And they said, oh sure, they didn't mind. Yeah. Um, and we promised we'd give some, you know, we'd grow some trees and give them back to you and you can restart your orchard or give it to your grandchildren or, or whatever. And what we were doing there is that we were doing a very conservative thing. We were conserving the old ways, the old heritage, mm -hmm. the old, the grandparents, what the grandparents had started. Respect, yeah. and, and they didn't have time to do it because they were flat out farming and all that kind of thing. Or, you know, it had fallen out of fashion, you could buy your food from the supermarket, so mm -hmm. why bother with the old orchard, do you know what I mean? But that, that meant that we'd moved into their way of thinking. We were conserving something that was um, a heritage thing. And I think what happened is um, those conservative farming, that conservative farming community saw us differently. But then they saw us doing what they do, and then that made that made us acceptable, I suppose, and we made a, from that point on, we've made a lot of progress, and we've had a lot of mm. conservative Southland people come and visit us here in the garden, mm. and um, go, oh, oh, I see what you're doing, yeah. it's not what I thought you were doing, but I see what, okay, so it's really good, in fact, um, one of the councillors asked me the other day, he must have seen something on television, there must be someone in the Coromandel who's got a forest garden or something, and I haven't seen this because we don't have TV, um, but they must have done well, well not done well, but weren't badly affected by Cyclone Gabriel, and so their, their forest garden had proved to be very resilient and unharmed, which is what I promote here, I said, look, any, we're not worried about any, well, you know, whether it's a deluge or it's um, mm. a cyclone or a drought or nothing, because it's so bounce backable, it's mm. so flexible and so resilient. So, um, yeah, so this conservative farmer had seen this program and he mm. said to me, Oh, you're doing something like that, aren't you? Could, could we come and have a look? I thought, Yes. <laughs> Uh, so at, at Riverton Environment Centre here we've got a bunch of different things going on and a few different things in the food space. One is that we host an organic food co-op here which has been going for more than 30 years and uh, we buy in organic products from around the country and where possible uh, we buy stuff locally and because we know we want to get more local stuff we're doing a lot to try and build up more local growers and producers. Uh, so even though we do buy in some apples from other parts of the country, we're pretty well known for having a massive collection of heritage apples. 
So we feature those at this time of year. We've got a window display that looks at uh, all the different varieties that are growing around here. Uh, and because the food co-op is run mostly by volunteers, we don't put much of a markup on the products. And so that means that when a grower brings in, like uh, Peter just this morning brought in some beautiful feijoas and um, the grower tells us how much they want to sell them for. And that the price that we sell them for is not much more than what the grower gets paid. So all we take off that is GST and a small amount to go towards running the food co-op and um, contributing towards the running costs of the building. Um, and so really important part of that is that those local growers get as much as possible for their local produce. So the other thing that program that we run uh, that people probably have heard of is called the Longwood Loop. And that's a, effectively it's a, it's a mobile farmer's market. So because our community is widespread and um, many of our small townships are, are quite a long distance away, we found over the years that having a farmer's market wasn't really successful because people had to come from a long distance to be here and they would pick a whole lot of stuff, bring it, stand at their, at their stall, not sell everything and then find that they were taking home a lot of unusable, unsellable produce. So Robin started thinking about a way that we could avoid have people having to travel a long distance to come to one place um, and came up with the Longwood Loop project. We've been running it for about 14 months now and it's based around a couple of key points. One is we've got an online shop that people can go to and all our different producers around the Longwood range list the products that they have available on their online shop. The public can go there, order whatever they like, they make one payment and that comes into an account that we then use to pay all of the different producers. Uh, and then on Thursday we have a fully electric van that starts here at Riverton in the Environment Centre, travels all the way around the Longwood Mountains, the Longwood Range, picking up produce from growers in those communities and then dropping it off to people who've ordered it. Uh, and through that system, 90% of the value of the products that are sold goes to the producer. That's something that we may have to tweak as we move forward, but the idea is that the producer gets the bulk of the value of their product. That 10% goes towards supporting our admin person who checks that payments are all working out. Um, it goes towards the cost of charging the van and insurance and that kind of thing. But uh, through that we have producers who are you know, very spread out and um, isolated and they don't have to travel more than about 10 kilometres to take their produce to a community hub. And from that community hub, the food is then collected and it's they're distributed out to the people in that community who make the orders. So it means that we've managed to reduce the distance that the individual producers have to travel to get their products to the market. It reduces the amount of travel that the consumers have to do to, to collect their produce. And it means that the whole system is being electrified is effectively decarbonized um, as much as we kind of can but the point we're at now with that project is to we know that we need to grow the project uh, and it's not just about growing the consumer base but also about growing the producer base and there's, that's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of a situation because you know we sure would get more consumers if we had more products available um, but at the same time, getting people to produce more products without having all of those consumers there ready, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a tricky mix. But um, we're running programs and we're always looking for funding sources to ramp it up to actually support more producers. So it's a real key focus for us is to locate people in the community who can grow more food. And it's not we're not talking commercial at all, commercial producers. We have many people who just have big backyard gardens and they will just put in a couple of extra rows of something and then it's very easy once they're all set up with the online system we use the open food network software for that um, and once they're set up on that it's very easy for them to go oh well i've got you know a couple of cauliflowers in my garden this week list them the whole process of it being sold is very easy easy for them to get paid it also means that no one is harvesting produce before it's been sold so you're not going to dig up a, a couple of kilos of carrots, take them to a market, and then find if they don't sell it, they go all limp, 
and nobody wants them anymore. Uh, so effectively, you get a notice as a producer saying you've sold two kilos of carrots. So out you go, pick your two kilos of carrots. They're sold before you even harvest them. So minimizing that waste, you know, there's, there's very little waste involved with that, the way that system works.